Hey, what is happening, everybody? Hey, Paul, how's it going again? Second time this week, I believe, right? Yes. Although you, isn't this your third stream this week? This is my third stream this week. Okay. That's how we do it. We just do it live all the time. I noticed that when I look at my second monitor, it's like I'm looking at you. So I could be like, Paul. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's a good thing, though. Yeah, it works. It, it, the audience, I'm sure, will, will play off of that for sure. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Well, welcome in everyone. So today we are doing a special live stream where we're taking Ask Seabrush questions, questions that you guys have asked us on our website, AskSeabrush.com, and we're going to be answering them live. So we're trying something a little bit different this year since Paul and myself, we're doing a lot of stuff this year, a lot of events, and which we're going to be doing a lot of promotion on that as well. So we thought, you know, instead of just making one-off videos, we can come in, do it live, hang out with you guys. And also, too, if there's any other questions you guys have besides what was already done at AskZBrush.com, you can come on and ask those questions, and we can answer them uh, and give you give you the, the answer right then and there. So without further ado, um, let's show my screen so I can show you the AskZBrush.com website. There it is. So when you go to AskZBrush.com, it will take you to this website where you could scroll through. And this part's the coolest and probably the most important is you can actually search for previously asked questions. For example, if I had a question about UVs, even though I have a question right here, or anything that's maybe Dynamesh related, then I can come in here, type Dynamesh, and it's already propagating. So when I hit search, it's going to narrow down our near 500 videos of AskZBrush into bite-sizable uh, videos that have already been answered. It's going to propagate that. And then you can go click on these and see what has been done. And anything that is done with Dynamesh, it even pulled up a live stream where I was covering that topic. So anything that has that tag in it, it's going to go ahead and try to find it for you. So if you do have questions, this is a good place to come in and actually try to search for them and see if your questions are already answered. And then on the other tab we have over here called Vote on Questions, you can come through. And at the top, you can actually type in your question, like, what is my question? Boom. And then you could send it on up, and then it will hit our server. And then questions that have been propagated up here, you could see there's a voting system. So if I really wanted to know how to measure the distance between two subtools, which we will be answering today, you can go ahead and click the upvote, and that's going to go ahead and upvote that. So it's definitely a way to come in, see if your question's already been posted, or if your question's already been asked. And then once a month, at the last Friday of every month, Myself and Paul will come on and we'll ask all these questions or answer all these questions for you. So definitely go into askzbrush.com. What's going on, everybody? Ooh, got some good vibes in the chat. Perfect. Paul, did you want to add anything before we get too, too started? Yeah, no, I think you covered everything. The goal here is for this web page. Um, obviously, the Ask Zebrush questions have been going for years. They're on our YouTube. Um, but we wanted to make one location where you can just only search those and maybe... When you're doing stuff in ZBrush, find the answers right here. So this is what why we built this page the way we built it with the searchability, every single video that's been done. Um, we also, these streams that we're going to be trying to do, like Ian said, every single month of the last Friday of every single month is the goal. We will also break them up back into individual videos for you as well and be placing them here in this library. So we're going to be answering six of the top questions uh, that have, you've already asked us and you've upvoted today. And then we're going to take some live questions as well. Yep. And just, uh, just a little sneak peek on one of the questions. Since we just released a new version of ZBrush, there's been some questions already that have been circling about proxy posts. So I will go over the proxy posts as well a little bit more in depth. And if you have questions about that, you'll be able to ask it. So there's a lot of really cool stuff 
happening. So don't be shy. Ask your questions. And, you know, let's go. Let's go on into it. Let's do it. So, Paul, what's what's the first question? Well, the first question that came in is how can you measure the distance between two subtools? So Ian is going to take that one. So I'll let you have that and I'll take care of the chat. Awesome. Perfect. Well, that's a super great question. So measuring the distance between two sub tools is actually really straightforward. So I'm going to show you how to do it first, and then I'm going to give you some context on top of that. So here I have a lightsaber that I was working on, you know, May the 4th is coming. So we got to get those Star Wars vibes started early. And here I'm actually looking at the fact that on my list, I have quite a few sub tools and I would like to measure from this point to this point, so I know exactly what that is. So the easiest and fastest way to measure between two subtools is to turn on your gizmo, and then I like to hit Y on the keyboard to bring up my transpose line. And what this will do is when I use the transpose line, it's gonna to snap to the first point that I click. If I press and hold the shift button and I drag on down, it's gonna to snap to the next point. Now at the very top, you're actually going to see here that it's giving me a distance of 0.2817 units. Now, the units are just defaulted at units, so what we can do now is bring in the context of how to get an accurate measurement. So I'm actually going to want to size this, so I'm going to go up to Z plugin, and I'm going to go to Scale Master, and I'm going to create a new bounding box subtool. This is going to help make an accurate measurement of my entire object. And then I'm going to turn on the wireframe just so that you can see that this bounding box actually gives you some edge loops perfectly in the middle that you could snap to. And then from here, I'm going to go ahead and say set scene scale. And by doing this, I'm going to pick a measurement that I would like to work in. And in this case, I would like to work in millimeters since I'm probably going to 3D print this. So I'm going to say millimeters. And now I actually want to size this up. And I'm probably going to want this just a few inches tall. So let me dock this on the left-hand side. And I'm now going to go on the y-axis. And we're going to call this, actually, let's go 75 millimeters tall and just say resize with all subtools. So I'm going to go ahead and resize this. It takes a minute. Look at all that magic. Boom. Now it is resized. So from here, if I wanted to know the overall size of the, of the actual subtool itself or the object, I could actually just go ahead and bring that transpose master line back up. And as I'm dragging, you can see here that, again, by holding shift, it's going to give me a straight line. And that's going to allow me to go ahead and measure the entire width. Of course, this is measurement is also here set in stone. So now to measure in the, between the two subtools again, I would do the exact same thing I did before. I would go back to that lens separator object that I have. I'll zoom in and I'm actually gonna drop it down to the lowest subdivision so you can clearly see the points here. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop this down here like such. And now again, I'm gonna take this object. I'm going to that transpose line, drag, hold shift, click to that point. And at the very top, it's giving me 5.6779 millimeters. So that's how you would measure any distance between two subtools in ZBrush. Super great question, by the way. So, all right. Any follow ups? Any questions on that so far? Well, I think you're muted, Paul. Yeah, I'm muting myself because I was typing. Uh, I don't see any questions coming through for that one in particular. So if no one else has any other secondary questions on that, we'll move on to the next question. All right. Very, All right, very cool. Okay, the next question, Paul. How can I merge two subtools together when using Live Boolean? Yep, so this one is pretty simple, uh, really easy. I prefer a particular workflow for myself when I'm gonna do this. So I pulled up here my Soundwave. Um, he's got various subtools to be exact. He's got 104 subtools in here. And I'm gonna go to the part where it's just his Canon piece. And I prefer to work with the folders because this will make it even easier for this question and an easy way to do this. So instead of coming down here and coming into the Boolean and merging the mesh this way, because this will look at all visible subtools and do them all and make a new tool, I prefer to have what I want to merge in one for the live Boolean part uh, in a folder. And so all I got to do is, in this case, you can see I have the Canon piece here, and that's this part right here. 
And then in this little gear, I'm going to click on that gear. And then there's going to be options through here for us. And you're going to have the two options. You're going to have Boolean folder and Boolean with DS div. Okay, so the difference between these two, and this is extremely important. In fact, I'll probably make them from both so we can see them. So let's do the first one, Boolean from folder. So you can see reason why I also like this is everything in the folder, including the folder has been turned off. And then the new piece actually stays within the same tool and it's just automatically added as a sub tool. So this is why I also prefer this method is everything stays within the one tool for me. And this is kind of what I prefer. Now, if we go the other way, we're gonna come back up here and then we're gonna say, all right, Boolean with DS div this time. We'll let that run through the process. And you can see that one took a little bit more time, but there's a reason for that. So I'm gonna turn off solo mode and you can see how clean the Canon is, right? It looks exactly the way that I've been modeling and how I want it to look. So this is the second one that I did, which is Boolean with DS div. Again, that was the option right here. And if we look at the first one here, you can see it's very faceted. In fact, here we'll turn the coloring off so you can really see that. So you see how faceted that is and how smooth that one is. This is a big difference. You need to understand both of these. Okay, so in this scenario, the first one, it looks nice and clean and smooth. All my pieces up here are low, low, low polygon. So I'm using Z Modeler to make these. So they're extremely low polygon as I cycle through these. And I'm even using a ray mesh in these, right? So this is being also used with dynamic subdivisions. So I want to apply the dynamic subdivisions before I actually merge everything. And so when I tell it to do this option, Boolean with DS div, I'm going to get this result. And you can see the topology is a lot more dense because we're applying the dynamic subdivisions first, and then we're merging everything for you where this option, there is no applying of the dynamic subdivs. It's just giving me all the low version of the polygons and then just merging everything together. Okay, so it's important to understand both options here but this is gonna be the easiest way to merge multiple subtools with live booleans inside of ZBrush. And there you go. This is a, that answers that question. Is there anything else that came through real quick? Uh, nothing came through yet on that. So no, doing good. Okay. <laughs> looking awesome, looking awesome. Just checking some of the chat for a little bit, just making sure, but yeah, I think that's, sure. that's it. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Um, how can you wrap a tube around an edge loop in ZBrush, Mr. Ooh. Ian? He's going to answer that one now. Ooh, I like that. I like that. So I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to demonstrate this on a basic primitive first. So I'm actually going to go ahead and with the cylinder, I'm going to come through here and actually make poly mesh. Perfect. There we go. So the way to go about wrapping a tube around is to actually utilize polygroups and our curve brush. So the way I would go about doing it, there's a couple. So the first way is if I wanted to just do a custom wrap around, what I would do is actually use the slice curve. And I would go ahead and slice an area so that that polygroup can actually give me a nice edge loop around that area. I can even subdivide up a little bit if I wanted some more resolution and then just go ahead and delete lower and then come through and do a slice. And again, I'll do two different slices so you can see here. And now with the curved tube, since we're dealing with tubes here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab the curved multi-tube. When I start dragging this out, if I go ahead and press and hold the shift button, it's actually going to go ahead and do a loop around. It's going to recognize the whole object and create a custom curve that's gonna wrap around that actual item. And then that's gonna go ahead and give me that loop. Now, if I wanted to do it on a specific edge loop, this is where the polygroups will come in because as I start dragging this out, so I'm going to go ahead and start dragging this out, press and hold the shift. You'll notice actually that when I touch an edge loop here, it's going to snap to that edge loop. And then here, so I'm going to drag this out, come through, let go, and it snaps straight to that edge loop. And even on the custom area here, I start dragging it out. You notice that it's identifying that edge loop and then it's going to go ahead and snap through. And with the cut with the curve multi tube, I can actually change the size now of both of those. So that is the way you can wrap around that tube. What you could also do, if I back this up just a little bit in time, 
if you have an item like this, and let's say we have multiple polygroups that we actually use groups by normals, for example. So now I have a different polygroup at the top and at the bottom and now in the middle. What I can do is come on up to stroke and go to curve modifiers. And I can actually utilize frame mesh on either the border, the polygroups, or the creased edges. Here, I'm going to use polygroups, say frame mesh. And now I can take my tube brush, and I can just tap one time. And now that is wrapping around that specific edge loop and that custom shape. So if you have multiple, if you have characters with different uh, shapes, or like you want to add bandages or any type of specific um, item to that, i.e. if I take this character here, and let's say I want to actually wrap a tube around maybe his glove. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete my lower. And then I'm going to, uh, let's actually step down just a little bit, delete lower, delete higher. I'm going to go ahead and create that new edge loop here. And then again, as I start dragging this out, once I'm holding that shift button, it's going to snap and recognize. And now you can do this with any curved brush. So it's a really quick and effective way to wrap not only a tube, but any custom curved brush that you have at your disposal. All right. All right. Keep them coming. So uh, as we're going along here, again, we have already prepared questions from you that are on askzbrush.com, which has been just saved in the chat. So we're taking these questions today. And again, we are looking to do this every single month at the end of the month. So we have a bunch of prepared questions from you all. So we're doing those. But keep your questions coming through the chat because Ian and I are going to try and tackle as many as we can in the stream as well. OK, so the next one that came to us. Sorry about that, Paul. I was just reading the chat for a second. The next one that came is, is there a way to influence the direction of primitives that are initially drawn out via the gizmo? Yeah, definitely. There's uh, a way to, to look at this and manipulate this in a different way. So I'm going to just turn off perspective. So we're just looking orthographic on this uh, mouse droid that I did for fan art for Star Wars here. Okay, so I'm going to switch to an insert mesh brush. I really like the model kit one. I'm a big fan of that. Let's use something like this so we can kind of see direction that's happening here. So the first thing to understand is when you guys draw out an insert mesh brush, its main thing is to look at the vertex point that you're drawing on. So if I come here to these corner in this edge here, it is going to automatically face the vertex normal. So as you can see in this one, it's drawn out on the angle of this. And then this one is drawn out on this direction. Okay. So when you are drawing them out, you can tell ZBrush to look at either that vertex or you can even tell it to look at the gizmo. So what I mean by that is you can see when you draw something out, the gizmos automatically have an orientation based upon how you drew it out. This blue arrow is always going to be facing down the direction of your insert, insert mesh brush. And that's also extremely important because I'm going to show you something by understanding what that blue arrow is doing and how something's being drawn out. Okay. You'll have a better understanding of this. So the first thing is drawing out and changing how this is laying out on the surface. So if we want to, again, I'm gonna turn on the gizmo. I'm actually gonna reset the gizmo here. I'm gonna hold the Alt key, click on that. That'll reset the gizmo as you can see, it's now facing a different direction. So that blue arrow is no longer following that surface. I love that I'm using my hand on the camera. Following this, we'll use ZBrush. It'll be a lot better for you all. And then now if we draw it out, okay, and I start drawing something out, and then you can see I can change the orientation of this being drawn out. So I don't have to follow along that vertex, okay? And if I hold now the shift key, you'll see the difference. You can see this is now facing perfectly in this axis compared to the original one that was on an angle. What's controlling that is the gizmo. So if you can, when you're drawing out, you can pick your direction. So you just use the gizmo. So if I now say, do something like, let's do something a little bit more like that, okay? And we start drawing out. If I hold the shift key, you can see that is pointing that blue arrow that I set. So that why is that's important for that blue arrow to understand that? So what this also means for you all 
If you guys are also with insert mesh brushes and drawing things out, you can see this piece has been drawn out and the rest are masked out. But now that I have this, right, we can rotate it and move it. And then understanding again, this blue arrow, this also opens up for you all. Instead of just also just drawing them out, once something is drawn out, and if you're in gizmo mode, you can just start cycling through your insert mesh brushes along the top. And you'll see we're going to swap them for you. And again, pay attention that they're all facing this blue arrow. So in essence, that blue arrow is the direction the mesh was picked up at. So that's why this is so important to understand. And this is how then you can control drawing something out and changing the direction of those primitives or those shapes. This also goes in conjunction with the primitives within the gear here too. So if you guys click on the gear, all these primitives. So if I click on say ring, you can see the ring direction is where that blue arrow's direction is. So there you go. I threw a couple extra things in there for you. But that's how you can manipulate it when you're drawing out your insert mesh brushes. It's all about using that gizmo as another secondary way to change your surface uh, direction of the insert mesh brush. Did I get everything? I know there was a bunch of stuff I saw popping in the chat, but I don't know if there are other questions they want us to answer later on. Uh, there was there was a couple other questions that are popping in, and I was uh, going through and answering some of them to uh, make sure. Also, there is somebody who's asking about one of the uh, the Zebra Summit prizes uh, that was emailed to myself. So I'm just actually typing in my email again. You can reach out to me, Don, um, and I will forward that information up to uh, whoever needs to to help process that. So just uh, just send me a follow-up email. We'll deal with that. We'll go straight through. Um, and then we did, somebody had another question about, um, had a question that was similar to what I had showed previously with the edge loop and the frame mesh talking about IMN brushes. And so um, we can cover that a little bit more in depth. I answered it in the chat, so uh, I can answer that more in depth um, after our other ones, if that makes sense. So, or I could just actually just elaborate on it now, if that works. Um, yeah, let me just elaborate real fast on that. Um, so going off script, sorry. <laughs> but basically, if you have an IMN brush that you wanna actually manipulate some edges around it, very similar to what I was actually showcasing. So the IMM brushes obviously allow you to pull out that mesh, but if you could turn any IMM brush into a curve, into a curve brush, so that you can have something like this. So if you had stitches that you built, that was an IMM, turn that stitch brush into a curve brush. And then from there, use the same tactic with frame mesh. And now you can wrap around those stitches around that curve. And again, too, you can adjust the size and adjust how big or small those items are. So if you have a, an IMN brush that you would like to wrap around an object like this, especially with stitches, you don't want to draw them out individually. That's a way you could go about doing that very quickly. All right. Cool. Excellent. All right. So on to the next question for you, which you're going to take. So you've got the next question is, why does the select lasso tool hide an edge loop and other times it hides a complete polygroup? Take it uh, away, Ian. I love this question. Actually, I love this question because I, I get this question a lot. So this is how. So let's break down what the select lasso is. So we're going to grab the select. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to answer this by grabbing the select rec, and I'm going to go ahead and drop my glove down to a low resolution, and then I'm actually going to go ahead and delete just so we're dealing with the lowest subdivision. So with the select rec brush. What it's allowing you to do is anywhere you click on a surface, it's going to recognize polygroups. So here, of course, I don't have any other polygroups. So me selecting anywhere, either on a face, a point, or an edge, it's just going to detect the, the vertices and the polygroup associated with that. Now, what makes the select lasso so unique is if you look at the select rec and you open up stroke, you'll notice you have four different strokes. And right now we have rec, circle, curve, and lasso. Lasso has a really fun special feature with it, and that is to detect edge loops. So when you're using select lasso, not only are you able to lasso a certain spot and select what you want, but it has the lasso stroke enabled. So when I zoom in, it's actually going to detect the face, the point, and the edge loop. So when I'm selecting, let's say, just the face, so I'm going to come here to the jacket because I have multiple polygroups here. When I select just the face or a point, it's going to select that one specific uh, 
polygroup that I selected. However, what's also unique to this is that if I select the point that has two polygroups intersecting with each other, whereas they're meeting up and I click that point, it's now gonna go ahead and grab both of those polygroups. But when I select an edge, an edge loop, it's actually going to select the edge loop in its entirety. So this is why sometimes when you're zoomed all the way out and you have such high subdivision levels and you're clicking, and if you catch an edge loop, which I'm gonna try to mimic real fast, which is just not working, but you catch an edge loop, there it is. You can see here that it's actually going through and selecting that edge loop in its entirety. So that's why it's selecting just the point. If you would like to avoid this, when you're making quick selections, you can either go to select lasso and select the rec brush. And now here, I'm gonna zoom down. Doesn't matter if I grab that edge loop, it is going to detect the entire poly group. And so you could quickly change that, or you could do what I do. I usually leave it there at the stroke and I just switch back and forth between the select rec and the select lasso to make specific uh, selections. So again, going up to select lasso, the stroke, the lasso stroke is what is identifying the edge loop, which allows you to select an edge loop as well. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. So moving on to the next question, I'm going to take, again, one of, and again, these questions that we're taking are coming from askzbrush.com. We'll share the page with you again in the chat. We'll show it again. So we can walk you through that page. And then we're taking questions from you all. Uh, you see the questions coming through and I have some stuff already to show. So what's the next question we have here? All right. The next question is, what is the workflow of the stroke curve function snapshot? What can I do with the curve after taking a snapshot? All right. Hey, so this, this one is a, this one's a fun one. I think they're, this one's a, sometimes missed one, I would say that um, there is a lot of advantage to us and some really fun when we did this. So I'm just going to use this mesh because it also ships with ZBrush. So it's something you all can also try again on your own. So let's make some new wings as an example for this character. So I'm going to turn off the current wings that we have, right? I'm going to switch to a different brush. I'm going to switch to a brush that has a curve function turned on. So I'm just going to go to either curve trifills, one I'm going to go with. All right, and then this brush is gonna allow me now, I can say, okay, I want the wings to maybe to go like this and then out like that, and then maybe come like this and then come back down like that, All right? And what this does is automatically create a surface for us. And then this can work symmetrically as well. So I've got an instant surface here. And then what I like to do when I have this, I still wanna edit it. So in the stroke palette, I'm going to turn on both bends. I'm going to turn on both bend start, bend end. And I'm also going to turn on both these locks. This is, I think, really important for manipulating this. Because now what this allows me to do is I can go to any part of the curve and even change up how maybe I want this wing to start looking. Because this is a surface that's being created on the fly. And by me just quickly making some adjustments here, and I can go smaller brush size, so I can manipulate different portions of it and get different wings. I can come and spread it out down here, spread it out that way. And the surface is updating for me instantly as I move through here, okay? And you can see there's differences happening here. But this is a main reason why I also turn these options on because I want, as I pulling on the wing, I want it to stay right where I have it on his body. Now, to the question is, what does the snapshot do? Well, the snapshot is going to do this particular brush by default is giving me a thickness, as you can see from above. And that thickness is being controlled by the draw size right now when it's red. Okay, so when it's red, it controls the thickness. So if I go with a large brush size and I tap on the curve, you can see the thickness, it gets larger. If I go with a smaller brush size and then tap on the curve, we get a thinner and we get more resolution along the curve. So now we can really manipulate this and put in some finer points that you might want to put in. And then I can say, oh, I don't like that. I can even smooth things out a little bit by hold, clicking on the curve and holding the shift key. Now to the question is I've laid down this surface. I like where this surface is at and I want to keep it, all right? But I want to reuse the curve now for something else. 
That's the point of this feature. So when you go to the stroke palette, we're going to close the curve and open up curve function. This is the snapshot. This is what the person was asking about. You can see the hot key for this is the five key. Okay. So if I click this, what it does is snapshots the surface, i.e. the wings in this case. Now they're there. They're staying. So if I manipulate the curve now, they're no longer going to affect the wing. But this also allows me to, I can even switch to a completely different brush that's a curve brush. So I could switch to curve tube and I can tap. And then you can see I get a nice border around the wing. I could switch. I'm a big fan of the extruder profile brushes. So I can switch to one of these, tap. And they get a completely different looking profile along the wing. So I can grab anything I want here and just start playing with this and getting different results. That's the point of this, right? Is being able to reuse the curve along the same piece. So like, even if I was to do a click on the surface and delete the curve, let's just go to something again, very visual for you all. Let's just use curve tube. You can now do things like, okay, now that you know this, let's have a little quick more fun with this. I'm gonna turn on my size. I'm gonna flip it vertically and let's, let's do a little bit of a curve that does something like this where it's tapering and I can move it around. But now if I hit the five key, right? I can now take and see, I can grab another one and then just move it. And if you turn off the bend parts of anything through here, so this bending, if you now hit the five key and now you'll see, you'll get the exact same surface mesh. And you can see this is no longer allowing bending. So this is also what that snapshot is for, is five key, give me the same thing again five key give me the same thing again okay so there's multiple ways to use that snapshot feature either reusing the curve to go along with something you've already drawn out or you've drawn out something and you want to just keep reusing that exact same mesh with the exact same result over and over and over again okay? and there you go that's how you would do that okay so that answers that question awesome well, you know, it's cool is actually uh, you just blew some minds with the uh, curved tri-fill brush. So there you go. Fastest oh, yeah. way to make wings. <laughs> yeah, there's also uh, like think about it also. OK, now we're going. You and I are putting our, our capes on. We're taking your questions now from the chat because those are all of our prep questions from the web page. Uh, so we'll show that web page in a second. But now you're now you're going to get Captain Tangents here. OK, it's, it's going to happen. Right. So that brush. Okay, there's two of them actually. There's a curved tri fill and there's a curved quad trail fill, trail fill. So the quad <laughs> fill one is giving you quads in the surface. The tri, tri one's giving you triangles. That's the only difference between the two. But what I want to highlight with these two brushes as well, which can be a lot of fun, is let's not forget about our handy dandy symmetry and radial symmetry. So as I'm drawing out, right, you can get radial symmetry of stuff, right? So that means if you switch to that brush okay we go back to curve we go to tri fill i can get you know flower power or propellers right or something for hard surface where hey i want to go a little bit bigger and i want to start manipulating and this all goes back to remember i told you about those locking parts this is what i really love you can kind of manipulate this and this is how i will create stuff like for hard surface maybe there's like a fan for something that's going to go in a turbine like that or like if you want to go the flower route you can make a flower so this becomes really powerful for you all, okay? So this is a way to go about it as well. Don't forget there's two versions of that. Oh, yeah. All right, I, Ian, is it okay if I take one of the first questions that came up in the chat? Yeah, absolutely, go right ahead. All and right. then I, and then after that, um, we had some questions that came in right after we posted the proxy pose. So I'll cover some of those as well, and then we'll take more. We'll take more questions. So go go for it. Yeah, I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the hair card one, and then you can show the proxy pose right after that, and we'll get to the wrap 3D text thing for you all. We'll get to that. We're taking questions now on the fly. Let's go. Buckle up. Boop, boop. All right. So for the hair card one uh, with hair, obviously for me the inside of ZBrush, I would just use fiber mesh. That's going to be the fastest and easy way. You can also have a brush. That'll work for you too. Um, but there's a particular reason why I might want to use fiber mesh. I'm going to show you really quick why I would. So I'm going to turn on a preview and we get a fur ball. All right. We're bringing the 80s back now. I love it. 
Okay, here we go. Or even actually the 60s, from Star Trek, really, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> if we can go further back. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the first thing is I'm going to just change the color so you guys can kind of see the fibers a little bit better uh, in here so they're a little bit brighter. And let's make them to have different colors too, actually. So we can really see that. And let's pick a different material. Uh, so it's just even brighter for us. Now it's really bright. Okay, so the first thing would be, if I'm doing hair cards, this is way too many fibers. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna knock this down. I might start at like 0.5, which is 500. Okay, so this number is in the thousands. So when you go to point decimals, you're now in the hundred. So this is a hundred pieces of fiber is what this is, right? So if I go 0.2, you're at 200. The next thing I'm gonna want is if I'm gonna be doing a hair card, I need some width to that. So that's where my coverage comes into play. So I wanna start, cranking that coverage up and I'm going to use also my width profile where you can still make the coverage be even larger. So now you're getting a larger coverage. Okay. This particular one also by default has the root being scaled out larger. So if I want to stay consistent, I would put this at one and see the tips at 0.75. I can put that at one, but you guys have full control. You can make this even have a taper if you want to. And in fact, you can use the graph as well to make the tapering that you want right the other thing here is they're they're not long enough okay so then that's the length so i'm just going to make them longer and then the last thing that i want to do just like anything we do when we're trying to even just sculpt in zbrush if we want something with details we got to kind of add some subdivisions right if i want this kind of aka hair right now to fall a little bit so it'd be a little bit more natural like hair I need more pieces of geometry in each one of these fiber meshes. So one of your most important sliders in fiber mesh is the segments. So if I put this at eight, you can see you start falling more. And because now there is actually eight, now in this case, 12 polygons on every single fiber now. Okay. So I've got 200 fibers, 200 individual strands, and then each one of them have 12 polygons. So the 12 times the 200, you're around like 5.4 thousand polygons total. This is what we're at. Okay, I don't like the twisting that's happening, right? So I look at it as like wringing out, a, you know, a towel. So there's a twist slider. So you can see you can really twist it. I'm just going to kill it and just put it at zero. So there is no twist. And then there's a revolve, which would be more for, definitely more for curly hair, I would say is better. So the question came through is they want to make a hair card and then have curly hair. Right? So if you're doing a hair card, then you're using images to drive this. Okay, so I want to now use this. And instead of having colors, I'm going to use an image. So right below the colors, I'm going to click on here. And then here's an image of hair. And all I got to do is click on this. And now this is asking me, hey, the image that you're bringing in is larger than the slider right now, which the slider is set to 128 pixels by 128 pixels. So it is asking me, do you want to resize this down to 128 by 128? Or do you just want to keep the size that this image is? So I'm going to say no and keep the size what this image is. And then now you can see this is being stretched across the fibers. And right now the image is not starting in the right location for me. So I want to go back into the texture palette. This is my image that I have. And I'm going to want to rotate this and have it go the other direction. And then now come back in here and update it. And so that the hair, right, is starting where it should be up here. And then it slowly becomes thin hair. And then now the next thing that I want to do, this is going to work in your engines, is now you're, this is an X and alpha channel. So in ZBrush, I can use it as an alpha channel. So I'm going to throw in an anti-alias. And then I'm going to start using transparency. And then there you go. And then now this is using fiber mesh as a hair card. And then having an image drive what that hair is going to look like. Now, the nice thing about this as well is if you guys forget to bring the image, right? And now I say, okay, this looks great. I'm going to accept this. And up in the subtool, it creates now a new subtool, which are my hair cards. And I went, oh, no. I forgot to make the image be a part of this. 
The problem here is how we're doing this is each one of those fibers were living in the same UV space. So zero one. But now that I did not assign a texture to begin with, these don't have UVs on them now. They're just fiber meshes inside a ZBrush. But the very nice thing here is when you guys use fiber mesh, we are tagging it inside a ZBrush as a fiber mesh. ZBrush knows this is a fiber mesh. So what's great is I can come down here, even though I forgot to get UVs on it, you guys can come to the UV map, come to your projection, and then there's literally a button that says fiber UV. Okay, so if you look at the texture map now, right, see it's all grayed out. I can't do anything, right? So if I grab, say, something like this, it's going to say, hey, you don't have any UVs. So I can say, well, it's a fiber mesh. So I'll just hit this button and then, bam, there you go. So we go in every single one. And remember, these are 200. We automatically go apply your UVs to all 200. And this is another example showing the alpha ability because this star has pure black as the background. So just like in your engines, they're going to say transparency and then they're going to apply an anti-alias and then there you go. This is going to be one of the fastest ways to create some kind of just universal hair cards and then that's it and just have UVs on it and then you go into where you're trying to go. I'm assuming if you're doing hair cards, you're going into an engine and then you're going to be using those within your engine and please don't forget there is a brush called Curve Flat and Curve Flat Snap that allow you even to draw out hair cards on your own, right? So there's this ability too, right? This is just a flat pieces of geometry now, okay? We'll turn off live Boolean. So there you go. So that's awesome. the hair card one. Hopefully that answers that. We'll kick it back to you, Ian, and you take the proxy pose one. Awesome, that was awesome. Paul, thank you so much. Um, so proxy pose. So proxy pose is a brand new feature that just came out on Wednesday. And so we have had some questions about it. So I want to basically go over that information again and just kind of cover what proxy pose is and what it, how you can utilize it, giving you some context along the way. So in short, proxy pose is a new feature right now that actually will reduce your mesh's size so it's a usable workable file for you to do any major changes whether it be posing or whether it be just inflating deflating or or just manipulating your file and then once you're done with proxy pose it's essentially coming back and giving you back all the details and even subdivisions if you have it it's not a projection it's literally storing that information and just reducing the mesh count so you can then manipulate the file and then get all that information back so here, for example, we have my Velociraptor, and he has subdivisions on it. Now, this is ideal in a lot of workflows, but what if my subdivision level one is still pretty dense, and I want it lower to then, but I still want to keep all those details, So, and I don't want to go through zebra meshing it again. So this would be one scenario in which you can utilize that. So here, under Geometry and Proxy Pose, which is a new menu above Dynamic Subdiv, is this new proxy post feature. And we have a couple items. So we have the ability to freeze borders. We have the ability to polish. So if you're working with hard surface specifically, this might be something that you would want to kick up a little bit. Then you have the actual reduction amount. And then we also have keep details. Now keep details is a really good addition slider because when you have things like this guy right here and you're starting to have points in your scene, when you open up proxy post, some of those points might get lost. So the keep detail slider will allow you to keep those higher details and those smaller points intact a little bit more so that you know you're moving the mesh around correctly. So here, let's just go ahead and showcase that it actually works with subdivisions. So I have subdivision level four, and he's about 2.6 million polys. So what I would want to do with this feature is I would actually want to come on over to the reduction slider. I'm going to turn on the wireframe. And I'm just going to start dragging this reduction slider. And you can see now that it's actually reducing that mesh down. It's almost, it's almost basically tessellating it on the fly for you. Now, what's really cool is at the top left-hand side, there is a percentage of how much the cage is built out of. So out of 2.6 million polys, we are using 1.2% of that mesh in order to manipulate our scene. So now our active points is about 16, almost 17,000 active points. So I'm gonna back this up though, and I'm gonna actually do the keep details because this guy has some details on him. 
but you don't need to go too high. You can actually do a little bit, say like start with like 10, maybe 15%. And then again, now I'm going to come through and I'm going to do a reduction. And I like to live around one to 2%. So the slider is very low, but you can see how much this is actually dropped. And now I'm going to go through and just really fast, I'm going to take the mass lasso and I'm going to just do a really quick scene manipulation with this mesh where actually I'm going to do one of my cool little tricks with the transpose master is drag out into uh, the cover of my selection and then press and hold the alt button and actually move with that white circle in the middle. I'm actually going to kind of bend this in this shape and then I'm going to hit R and rotate this around. So I get a nice quick little selection and maybe two. We'll hit R again, not T, and we'll drag this down. And then let's actually push it just a little bit more. Again, just kind of holding that spot there. You can even, too, um, come through and just use like any brushes that you would like. Say maybe Move Infinite, which is an awesome brush. If you're not using it, it's going to grab what I'm picking on the surface and then infinitely in depth what that is. So I could take a nice big brush and then kind of move this down a bit. So once I get the pose that I like, and again, I'm just going to do another quick change. So I'm going to go ahead and isolate this, alt this gizmo tap, and then I'm going to rotate this head just a little bit just so you can see. Now that I have this change, I want to send this back. And the perk with this is that you can see how low resolution this mesh is. And then as soon as I say proxy pose, it's going to move that mesh, and then it's going to go ahead and bring back all those details. And you can see here, that was pretty clean. Now, this was with one mesh with multiple subtools. So you can see here that I didn't move the eye. So of course, I could actually, if we go back in time here a little bit and move this here, I can in this grab multiple items. So I can open up the gizmo and turn on the transpose all selected subtools, aka pizza box. And I can grab multiple items. And then I can actually come through and then move this around so that my eyes actually move the way I want. And then again, just hitting that proxy pose, going up to geometry, proxy pose, turn it back on, is going to go ahead and then get all those details back and put the cage where it was, including the subdivisions. So this is a really awesome tool in order to make big changes quickly. And for all you 3D printing enthusiasts out there, if I go to a merge subtool that was either dynameshed or has no uh, subdivisions whatsoever, it's the exact same process. Now, what's also really neat is that Notice that when I was working with the other one, it remembered my reduction amount slider. So when you are working through this and you're working with that subtool, if you find something that you like, so say something like right about here, which is that 1%, when I turn proxy pose off, it's actually going to remember my settings. And that's important because maybe you make a change and then you actually want to go ahead and then make the exact same change again. And you already found your settings. It's already there for you. So this works with subdivisions. And this also works without subdivisions. So if you have big files, again, you can make those changes. Now, let's say I work with Transpose Master. So same exact thing. I have this mood file. If you want to work with Transpose Master, so if we come back to maybe this guy right here, and I'm going to put him back in time. We're going to go back to the beginning because I have multiple subtools. Perfect. And let's just say this one didn't have subdivisions, but all the other ones do. So everything has low subdivisions, but this is the only one that didn't because I didn't want to do that at the time. What I could do now is I can turn on my proxy pose on this one mesh, get what I want, come on up to the Z plugin, go up to Transpose Master, and now I can send this in. I can even turn on the layer system and work with a layer system with transpose. So if I wanted to make big changes to everything, but I wanted to attach those to a layer, I could turn on layer and I could go to transpose mesh. And now it's going to send this on over. And any change I make to my subtools, it's going to propagate a layer for me. So again, making those same changes, just because you know we keep things simple. I'm going to come through here. I'm actually going to make just something a little bit slightly different for funsies. So let's come over here. I'm going to bend this a little bit, say something like that. Perfect. And then maybe let's just come through, bring this down. Awesome. You can even, with the gizmo, adjust the focal length. And now you can get some really interesting movements because it's not a sharp movement. It's now giving me a little bit of a soft transition and bend to it. So I could do something like that. 
come through here, again, selecting this area, masking it out, making my transpose fun and unique. So I'm going to come through, rotate this down, just so you guys get it. And then let's rotate the head this way down. Perfect. OK, so we're done with our pose. And now let's actually, you know what? I'm sorry, just for fun. I'm going to I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to rotate them this way. Bam, perfect. Now we want to send them back. So I'm going to go to Z plugin and I'm going to go ahead and say T pose send back to there. And it's going to go ahead and send that back. But we still have proxy pose active. So now from here, I can go ahead and say proxy pose. And it's going to go ahead and bring back all those details for me. There it is. And so everything changed and happened. And you can see here, too, it's it's really, really nice and subtle with the details. It's preserving a lot of those details that it's just really helping me. So I don't have to spend too much time fixing my model up the way it is. So that is another way that you can utilize proxy posts. So really look at it as a way to manipulate your mesh quick, fast, and in a hurry without having to always go through and optimize the mesh, especially if you work in, let's say, something like asymmetry, where you know if this was a dinosaur statue and I don't work from a T-pose and I'm not worried about you know any type of uh, you know subdivisions or if my mesh looks really pretty or not, I can utilize this feature to help make those changes quickly by knocking it down to a lower percentage. So those are those are the ways that you could utilize it. I've also utilized it with Z spheres. So if I reload this real fast, so let's see, here's my here's actually my pose one, and I actually have a pre-built skeleton made from Z spheres. So I can now come through here with my merged one, and I'm going to duplicate this. Anytime I work with with posing, I always keep a backup mesh for T posing. So just to, so I have something to fall back on. So I'm going to go ahead and just hide that one. And now I have this main merged one item. So now I can go through, and again, without having to go through the T-Pose mesh, which you absolutely could, you can click Z-Sphere rig and then go into T-Pose mesh and build your own rig. But if I wanted to stay within this scene because I'm only working with a merged item at this point, or I have other subdivision or other models that I don't mind that are low that have subdivisions, Again, I can just come through, take my main mesh, and turning on proxy pose. So now I have this. And then I'm going to go ahead and go to my skeleton. Now, I want to make sure that when I go to adaptive skin, that the density is at 1 and that the dyna mesh resolution is at 0, because this is going to help preserve my mesh of, of uh, my dinosaur. And then I'm going to come through on rigging, select mesh. Now I'm going to find that proxy pose mesh. Now this part's important. And this was one of the questions that did come up, which is I've made multiple iterations of my mesh, but only some of the items move over and other items don't. The thing to remember is that when we're working with proxy pose, we come back in ZBrush, when you're utilizing or you're wanting to, to when you're utilizing this mesh, you want to keep the vertice count the exact same. So if I make a proxy mesh, utilizing you know 10% and then I make another one utilizing 5%, those are two different mesh counts. So it's not going to transfer the information correctly from one to the other. So you want to make sure that when you use your proxy pose, again, I come through here and I make a duplicate and then this is the one that stays proxy pose. So now I can make multiple versions off of that one count so that I know the vertice count is always the same. So when I say go to rigging and now bind my mesh, now I'm going to come through here. I'm going to take the move brush. I'm going to select the actual uh, link between the two. So this is going to give me a nice little animation uh, movement. And we can even go ahead and turn off uh, symmetry so that we can get some asymmetry movement. So I can move this over. Again, I'm clicking the chain. If I click the Z-sphere itself, it's actually going to stretch or shrink the mesh that's attached. And we don't want to do that. We want to preserve it as much as possible. So you want to click the chain itself. And then again, I'm going to come through. I have this dinosaur guy. I'm going to move this up. And we're going to go ahead and just make a couple little, little changes right there. Perfect. Now he's like a happy little walking dinosaur. And I'm going to move this. Can even use rotate. Rotate his body just a bit. Perfect. Now that I have what I want, I'm going to hit A on the keyboard, which is going to show me what that mesh looks like. From here, I'm going to go to Adaptive Skin. I'm going to say Make Adaptive Skin, which now makes a permanent version of this low mesh 
and another subtool. So here it says skin raptor skeleton. That's one. I now can either save this out or I can copy it and now put it into my merged file and go ahead and say paste. And there it is. Now this is, I'm going to name this pose one. Now we're actually going to do this one more time. So I'm going to hide this and now I'm going to quickly do this one more time. So I'm going to go back to the raptor skeleton, hit A again. If I want to reset this pose, just come back to rigging and unbind it. Resets your whole pose. Rebind. And now we're going to make another one. So now I'm going to actually have him maybe standing up a little bit. So I'm going to move his body up. Maybe he'll be looking upwards. Say something like this. There we go. And maybe this time we have a leg that's like starting to step backwards. And maybe we'll have one that's starting to move forward just a little bit. Say something like this. Now I have a secondary pose. He's now standing up. Again, you're going to press A. And then from here, adaptive skin, make adaptive skin. This gives me a secondary one. But we've been working off of the same type of mesh. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and copy this, go back to my merged file. So here it is. I'm going to paste this in. And now I'm going to call this pose two. Perfect. Now I'm going to go back to my original duplicate where the one I did the proxy pose. And now I'm going to go to geometry and hit overwrite pose. And you'll see here, I now have two different posing options. I have pose one and pose two. And I can switch between the two while I'm in proxy pose to find out which one I really like. So you show your art director, your client, your boss, your friends, like, hey, look, we could go like this or we can go like this. And they're like, yeah, I really like the first one. So you go back to the first one and then you say proxy pose and then it brings it all back. So there's a lot of different ways you can go through all of this so that you can actually quickly and effectively pose your models and keep all those details really effectively. So hopefully that clears up how to use proxy pose and gives you some ideas on how you can actually go about using this new feature. Nice. Okay. Uh, the questions uh, we're coming through were also other things. They were very excited about this feature. I'm going to go on a little rampage here and a crazy tangent. Do it. Okay. Do it. <laughs> so, there's like four of them I'm going to try and answer here in under one minute. No. Okay. So <laughs> I answer it that quick, you guys won't get the information. Okay. So the first one that someone asked, like when we started the stream, uh, they asked that they were using the lasso um, in here. Okay. The mask lasso. And when they mask this, they don't want it going to the back end. There's no way for this. This is camera dependent. And then it just sees all the geometry through that lasso. So what I told them really the only way to do that is hide the portion of the dog. But there is something that you can do to make this workflow a little bit faster for you all. Right. And this is something that I personally do. So I right now have mask lasso. I have select rec. Okay. And then I have the paintbrush. So we have three brushes selected at this time. So instead of me going up and even doing the shortcut like with control shift, you guys can actually, I look at the side of the dog, do this, and then I can switch right to my selection, hide that part of the dog, and then go right into my lasso. I don't actually have to go up and in here and click and actually even use the control and shift. Obviously, that would be, you could same thing, hold control shift, and then now just inverse it, right? But I wanted to show this ability because this also works with what if you had now not select, what if you had knife curve as an example, and that's what you're using instead of select, right? So now you're like, you've got a lasso, you've got a paint, and you got a knife curve. But now you want to deselect a portion of this dog and not have to come up in here. So you can, again, start drawing it out and then switch right to it. I'm going to hide the portion, go to the front of dog, oh, sorry, and then do my mask. And then there you go. That's it. I'm switching between the brushes really fast without actually even going up to the brushes. And I still then have knife curve selected. So what I'm doing to do this is I am clicking on when I let go, like this is a all together with me, everybody. Lisa needs braces. Lisa needs look up here in like all together of my favorite sayings here that are just they are what they are. I am not holding the keyboard. Right. This is personally that you guys should get used to doing this. When you're starting to use these control shift brushes, you don't need to hold down the control shift because then it opens things up space bar. But what this opens up, if you guys tap the control key, 
when you tap the control key, we will automatically switch to the select rectangle. Okay, no, you can't switch the select blast with this time. It's only select rectangle. And then now I can hold I can hold the alt key, make it a red box, and then that hides the mesh. So that also goes with masking. So if you guys are masking last and you're like, oh no, I want to go to the selection real quick, tap the control key, and now you've got the selection, alt key, hide, and then now go back to the front of your model, and then there you go. This is going to be the fastest and only way that you're going to be able to not have the mask go all the way through the model. It, it needs to see the whole model. So it, I mean, when it's masking, so you got to hide a portion for it not to go through. Okay. So moving on then to the text one, uh, let's make some text really quick. So I'm just going to use ZBrush to do that. Um, so we're going to come into the plugins. I've already docked it. So Z plugin. And then I'm docking it over here. All right. And now what we're looking for is this one right here. Text 3D and vector shapes. So you can use VDMs to give you instant like logos. and Or even just, I've seen artists use VDMs to just make particular alphas and shapes from that. And it's worked out great for them. But the question came through wrapping a text around. All right. So I'm going to say new text. Okay. And then I'm going to say ZBrush. And then hit enter. This is now going to make a new text. This text is automatically going to have thickness to it. It's automatically going to have polygrouping. So there's a polygroup for the front, the middle, and the back. And then this is going to use any font that's on my computer. So whatever I pick, I click here and I pick the font that I want to use. I can even load fonts if I want to. So if I go get something else, you can even load a font. You can choose it to be bold. You can choose it to be light. So all this is going to be loaded and it's only going to use true fonts. All right. Um, and then this is going to be, okay, do I want to control the thickness in here? So how much extrusion do I want? So I'm going to go relatively lower. How much resolution? So and it's how much topology do I want to really define, especially when you get in certain shapes where you really need some roundness, like through the S and the H. You know, if you go too low, See, it breaks the S and the H and the B. So I need some resolution through there. And then do I want even a bevel on this? So you can start even beveling automatically the shapes there. Right, so this is what uh, uh, this plugin is going to give you the ability. All right, so the question came through is, okay, well, now you want to take this and you want to wrap it around something. So let's go to this cylinder as an example. And we're going to append now the word ZBrush. There it is. Okay, and now I'm gonna move this forward and I'm gonna size it down because it seems rather large to be wrapped around. Okay, so if I am starting in this direction, i.e. I'm starting with something that already is flat and now I want it to wrap, this is a different way of thinking about it compared to if I wanna now turn this into a brush, I also can wrap it that way. There is multiple ways to do this. I'm gonna show two in particular that can be beneficial for you. So the first thing would be the mesh that I'm getting from the plugin, its goal is to just really hold the form of the text or the uh, SVG that I'm sending. Okay, so the geometry is gonna be really low, triangulated and crazy a little bit in here. Okay, so what I would probably do for this, if I want this to wrap, it's based upon the topology that's gonna to start having the wrap happening. And then this is very low and very huge triangles. So I need some more topology. So I would either do two things. I would either Z remesh this with using the polygroups as a way to do this, right? So I would either come in here, I'd go to Z remesher. I would definitely say, let's use our polygrouping in here. So keep groups. I don't want any smoothing. And I would probably give this a lot more topology, like something like that, and let it remesh, and then try and give me that there. That's a much more dense piece of topology to manipulate, okay? This would be one way. The other way would be just turn it into a dynamo. Oh, Dinah. Oh, Dinah. Richie Valen, baby. There we go. I once had a ZBrush. Okay, so Dynamesh in there. So the idea here is you need more density for this workflow because now I want to use a deformer, okay? So in the gizmo, I can come in here and there is a bend arc deformer. 
Now you can bend across multiple axes here. So you're going to have three sets of cones, three sets of cones, and three sets of cones. They all do the same thing. The, all the greens do the exact same thing. All the white and all of the yellow do the same thing. What they are representing is each axis. So if I do this, see, it's a rotation. If I grab the green cone, see, it starts to wrap it. Okay, so then I would want to probably start using what wrap do I want? Whoops. Okay, so I would probably want to do the one that would work the best for me. And then you have a white cone. So when you're doing the white cone, this will change the gap of this. Okay, but then of course for these, you need more density to start wrapping these, right? Because if you don't have the proper density, then you're gonna run into problems. Okay, so you wanna start wrapping this in different directions in different ways. So this would be one way to go about this. Right, so I'd probably start wrapping this way around, okay? And then this is the beauty is I can start looking in different angles. And as you're grabbing the orange cone, you see that there's three degrees. So two of these, this one, this particular cone, right, is gonna wrap in different ways. And then here's where the white cone comes into play. I want this to hug a little bit more to the surface. And then now you just start manipulating this and bringing this in. So this is a way that you all can start having this wrap to fit along a cylinder. And then the benefit of this is this is topology, right? This is existing topology that I'm manipulating and playing with, right? So this would be possibly one way if you already have something existing. Let's say we don't have anything existing now, right? And we have just a cylinder here, right? And then this cylinder has been divided up and I've got a polygroup on the top, polygroup on the bottom, Okay, and then there's another polygroup. This also, if we walk down, this edge is creased, this edge is creased, and then I used a creased edge right here, right through here. And then what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do, which I've already done on this, is under the UV, under the wrapping here of the UVs, I want to go crease unwrap and unwrap based upon the crease. Okay, so what I get is this. Right, so this would be a way, think about in the sense, if you have a flat piece, i.e. your UVs, you can now just use an image. So technically you could go use any piece that has UVs and then now you'll be able to manipulate this. Okay, so the thought process here, okay, I got a UV version of this model now, awesome. Right, so I'm gonna unmorph this. And then you're telling me is if I have enough resolution and then now I can go to texture map and grab a texture and I've grabbed this BAM. This is what we get. So you can see this BAM image is being spread across the UVs. Now here's something that I think you guys may have not used yet that I once I show this to you, this should open up a lot of aha moments, hopefully for you all. And you can see the real power here. So a couple versions ago, I wanna say now four or five versions ago, I would say now, we allowed you in this morph state, you can sculpt on it, you can paint on it, you can do whatever you want in this morph state. Okay, so what that means is I can say, okay, this is perfect. I'm gonna now bring up that image, bam. And it, this image is in, in spotlight right now, is where this is. So I can then move this image wherever I want on here. Okay, I can size it, I can rotate it. I, it. I got freedom to do whatever I want here with this. And I can position this where I want based upon the UV layout. And then now this can be projected because we are allowing you in UV state to actually sculpt and paint. So right now I'm just painting, okay? And then now I'm just gonna say, let's paint this bam on this UV layout. So there, it's it's painted. There we go. So if I turn this off, you can see now that paint has been applied to the model. Let's switch to standard brush real quick here. So we add even a sculptural element. I'm going to do freehand. Oh, and uh, I actually had just boom, boom, boom. That was bam. That, that was a, that was the bam. <laughs> that was the bam. That was well, the bam. <laughs> Perfect. Sure. 
Well, well, just just a sneak peek while you're while you're coming back. A sneak peek is that I get asked a very specific question all the time during my streams, and it's always about cam views. And so I realize, you know, we don't. I don't think we have a cam view ask ZBrush question. So that will be the next question I'm going to cover, uh, which is uh, cam views. How to do your own cam view, especially since you know tons of people use cam view for reference or just want to show off their model, and it's a really really awesome way to do it. So I'll be covering that next. Yeah, you can do it now because I got to reload everything in now. So. Oh no! Okay, you great. Hey, I got to reload. Nacho broccoli like cheese sauce. Let's do it. We'll come back. To All Mike. right. Go back. Well, to then let me go ahead and just take that. Take that. Much. <laughs> I've been asked this question a lot. All right. All right. So you want to make a cam view, yeah? So this is how you can make a cam view up here at the top within ZBrush. There's a few steps to go about doing it, but do not worry. It's pretty simple. So. First thing is what you want to do is whatever model you're working with, whether it be your Raptor, your lightsaber, your little, you know, accidental guy that looks like for some reason Star Lord, whatever character you're working on, you can turn it into a cam view. And the way to go about doing it is to make a merged visible of that object. In this case, I've already had and I've done that with this Raptor, but again, like I would just take this and I would want everything to be on one sub tool. It's just way easier to do it. So you could say merge visible at the top and then it will isolate that for you. And then you have something like this. Now, the reason why that you would really wanna do that it just makes it easier in my opinion to go ahead and go work through things, but you wanna send this to the home position. So I'm gonna utilize this Raptor. I'm gonna open up the gizmo. I'm gonna center this to my model and then I'm gonna send it home. And it doesn't really matter what size you're working in. You could just hit F to frame it for the full frame is that you'd want so you could see that we have this nice Raptor staring us into our soul. So now from here, what you're going to want to do is go to document and let's make a color true black down at the bottom because zebra sees black as being completely invisible. So I'm going to go to the document, go to back, and I'm going to make the background completely black. This way, my model gets to shine perfectly on a texture when we're done. Now to find where the, where the cam view lives, if you come up here to preferences, and we're just going to dock that on the right hand side. We're going to come on down and you're going to see that we have the option that is cam view. Now we have a size slider, so we can change the slicing if we want. We can also say next. if We want to go through all the ones that we have saved. And then, of course, we have a make cam view button, which is what we're going to be living on today. So once your model is perfectly centered in the world and the gizmo's there, all you're going to do with the black background is say make cam view. And it's going to go ahead and run through that whole thing. And if you focus your attention at the very top, you'll now notice that my raptor head is there. And everywhere I look, he is looking as well. Now, just real quick note, when you make this cam view, make sure that the cam view that's originally up is facing in the proper direction so that you know front is front and back is back so you don't lose yourself. But now that we have that, if we look on over to the actual texture here and we hover over this, you'll see that it created a texture with us with a transparent background. And this is super important because we're gonna to wanna to save this out. So I can go ahead and click on this texture and we can say export. And now I can export this out as either a Photoshop or a PNG because they're gonna support the transparency. And then of course you wanna save this in your actual project file. So we're gonna go into our C drive. We're gonna to go to our Maxon 2023. This also works within the uh, perpetual of the old PixLogic license as well. So you can go through there as well. Then you can do your Z startup and then cam view, which is where all of these live. And you'll notice that all the cam views are PSD files. So name this whatever you would like. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and say Raptor head staring at me. There it is. And I'm going to go ahead and say save. And now that is saved in that section. And then all I need to do from there is go to preferences, config, and store my config. And the very next time I load up ZBrush, he's going to be there staring at me, judging every little thing that I do. So that is how you make a cam view. Super nice, super fun, and effective. And then, of course, too, you can always change your document background size if you don't want to work in the black back to any color or just that typical gray that a lot of us use. And there you go. That's how you make a cam view. So now when I ever get that question, I'm just going to point back to this. <laughs> Perfect. OK, I'm back. Are you back? I'm back. Yes. He's back. Okay. So back again, once life. again, I'm in spotlight mode, which I go to the texture. I click on the image, and I hit this button right here, add to spotlight. 
And then now I have the spotlight ability to positions where I want. And then I'm just painting again this bam. If you want to kind of see the paint, by the way, you might want to turn on the actual spotlight radius, why it's called spotlight. And now the image will disappear, but wherever your brush goes, you'll see your image. So then you can, as you can see, I can see the paint now happening live without the image getting in the way. Right. So this is, again, I have a flat surface and I'm just painting where I want that bam to go. All right. And then now when it's done, you just unmorph and then there it is. Right. And then it's going based upon the flat surface, which in this scenario, we have a rounded cylinder. And then now all you need to do is tell ZBrush to use this paint to mask. Right. So then now I can go into masking go into mask by color here i'll move this up there we go mask by color and if you you can even have a different color so you can mask by any color now that you can hand pick and in this scenario i'm just going to mask by the pure black so i'm going to say mask by intensity what does that do that will give you a mask based upon the pure black in this scenario so if i even inverse it you guys can now go this direction with it. You can come in here. I'm going to hide the mask. Okay, so that it's uh, maybe not. This, this is not helping me today. I hit it. No. <laughs> uh, where'd you go? Right. Hold on. There you are. Bam. It's not, playing, it's not playing well with me, my shortcuts today. So you can hide your mask here. Okay. And then now you want to inflate. So you can inflate this inward. Or outward. And again, you could also put this on a layer if you wanted to. And then there you have this where it's actually sculpting into the surface. Or you can use the mask and come into here an old school, use the extract, and then just extract from the mask. And then now you have the geometry. Okay. Yeah, definitely ask a question. That's the point of this stream. This is the Ask Zebra stream where you have myself yep. and Ian available to answer your questions. Okay, so Every this week. is a couple ways that you can have a text wrapped around. Either use your UVs and go about that. And again, the reason why it bammed on me is because when I actually flattened based upon the UV, so here we'll use we'll use Mr. Earthquake because he's got, always going to make a, an appearance. It's pretty much mandatory. So, and it's just because you'll be able to see what's happening here. When you morph UV, I had turned my bump off. So you can see with the bump on, you can see where your sculpts are. And then why you would want to do this kind of items is because then you can take a sculpting brush, right? And then you can sculpt across this way, right? So it will turn off the color. So I am sculpting this direction, which means is also if you use different things like here, we'll go a little bit more intense. I can sculpt right across something. That's easier than trying to sculpt around the arm in the 3D form. Or if you introduce something like Lazy Mouse, you can draw straight across like a line, straight across, right? And then see, I can repeat that over and over and over again. And when it gets picked up, okay, see, it's going to wrap around the arm based upon where I was sculpting on the flat version of this. Right? Oh, yeah. so this this is the nice thing about the Morph UV. Morph it come across and then do this, right? And then one, one key, okay? If you want to, you can make it subtractive. You can do anything you want here, right? So you can do a lot of different things through here and then pick it back up. And now on the other arm has the line that I was drawing. And then you can do color too. So if you decide to add some color, that color would also be picked up along the surface Bam. wherever you put that and then boom there's the color being picked up and you can mask as well 100 percent. you can mask you can use spotlight you can use paint you can use sculpting i think this is a super powerful feature that i don't think it's really being used enough that yeah no i don't think it's been used a lot and actually that's uh something that my i was going to mention is that when you're using more uv there's a bump slider and it's set to 50 at default. Think of that as a nice friendly way to remind you that it is sculptable in that and paintable in that, in that uh, 
when it's laid out like that. So definitely utilize that feature. You can always set that bump to down to zero if you want to check your UVs and just make sure they're clean. But if you want to work on them, it's set to 50. That's kind of a nice little reminder of, hey, you can sculpt on me. Please sculpt on me. And like Paul said, that's a great way. Instead of having to work around in the 3D space, you know, you can utilize lazy mouse, get really nice straight lines, and then snap it back, and you are good to go. So, yep. cool, Paul. Well, there yeah. was another question that popped in. Yep. One, I could take it, because I, I do this a lot. I can show a couple ways of going about this. Sure, go ahead. I'm going to take it. Back to the end screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So this question actually is talking about um, how can you set up multiple camera angles for checking your character likeness? You know, what are the ways you can go about doing that? It's actually a couple ways you can go about doing that. So the first way that I use all the time, because I usually sculpt for, you know, 3D printing, and I like to work in orthographic. So this is a great way for me to do that, is that I'll actually use the timeline for that feature. So I'll take my character, say something like this, and I'll go ahead and go up onto movie, and we're going to dock that on the left-hand side. And I'm going to click on timeline and show this timeline. Now, what's neat about this is that what I can do is I can say, I need the front view. So I'm just going to come up and click one time up in this area. And then I'm going to go ahead and rotate to the side and get my profile. I'm going to make another link just like that. And now I can even use the arrow keys. And now this is a locked position because it's up in the timeline. So if I'm working on this, I zoom out and I'm going through and I'm making my sculpting. So let's go ahead and tear them up. I'm sculpting. Now I want to go ahead and check that. I can come through and I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard, the left and right arrow keys to come back to that position, which means now what I can do is if I had a texture of reference that I was leaning on, I can now go up to my texture. I can bring in that texture, whichever it might be. In this case, we're just going to use this as quote reference. So I'm going to go grab out my texture in, come back on up, and I'm going to make that into the spotlight, expand this up. So here's my rafter texture, just pretend. <laughs> and now I can go ahead and hit Z. I can line this up with my mesh, right? And then I can go ahead and snap to that angle. So I would be able to check that against. And of course, you can change the transparency of this as well. So I'm just going to hover over, say opacity, drag this down, so then I can and then scale this up. And then I'd be able to line up my reference with the actual model and double check that each way. So it's a really cool way to go about doing that. That's the first way. Now let's go ahead and hide that. The second way that you could set up camera angles again for checking is actually with the camera system built in under draw. So I'm going to set up the draw on the on the right hand side and underneath there is a store camera selection. Now the store camera works with perspective mode so I will need perspective turned on and I'm going to actually change perspective to 85. That's about where I work when I do work in perspective. And then from here, now what I can do is I can pick a position and I can go ahead and say store camera, but this is going to let me actually name my camera. So I can call this my, my front view, right? And then from here, I could store another camera. So let's say this is my side view. I could store this and call this my side. And then I can turn this around and maybe call this my three quarter. So I'll store another one and say three quarter. Now from here, if I click up here at the top, you might notice that I have front side and three quarter and I can just pick between the ones that I want or I can utilize the arrow keys to rotate between them and actually select which one that I want. I can even pick one and rename it, call this side one because now I'm gonna want a secondary side so I can go through and rename that. You can load an image, you could store these cameras out if you would like and you can even change model opacity if you need to check it against something. So there's a lot of really fun ways to do this. Of course, you can also delete one camera at a time or everything all at once, and then that's going to go ahead and cut through. So there's another way to set up for any type of reference control when you want to have a very specific angle. And again, as I come through and I turn on symmetry and I start making those changes, give them a little bit of a hairdo, and then come through, click a camera angle, and now it's going to send me right back to where it was. So those are the two really effective ways to go about doing that. Hey. Are you there? Yeah, take it back. Okay. All right, the spotlight one, um, turning the spotlight on and off, the question you're asking, because you've already assigned the Z key. 
right here is where you have shift Z to actually turn off spotlight on and off physically. Like, so is it act on or is it off? Right. And then you want, can I go back and forth between image editing and then projection? So that's the Z key by default. And that one is found in transform and right here. So you can edit spotlight is the Z key. And so now you who was asking, I lost it. And Sammy, there's where you go. You just make your own hotkey now for that. And you can make that any hotkey that you want. Okay. Um, the one for transparency asking um, and Redshift rendering a movie. Yes, that's all possible. It's been possible since the release. So you can use our timeline and you can render out something, put this guy in motion, which I've had this guy in motion. So this guy actually, I think if I remember right, see he's got motion in it already. All this can be rendered in a movie either with ZBrush's BPR or Redshift. And it'll all be exported into a movie file for you, whichever renderer you want to use. So someone asked about rendering transparency with BPR and Redshift. They're different of how they're going to work, right? So if you're going to render with ZBrush BPR, and so in this case, we're going to want to select, say, the eyeballs in this scenario here. So here we'll, we've got the eyeballs here, okay? So if I want these eyeballs to be transparent for the zebra. So I'm going to split them off, uh, which I'm trying to remember if I have subdivision levels. I don't think I do. All right. So these, these eyeballs are separate now from the body. So then I got to tell ZBrush that I want these to be transparent when I do go and render. All right. So if I'm just doing a BPR render, which is a ZBrush render, and then just the sake of speeding up this whole process, I'm going to knock this down. I'm going to turn off a bunch of other stuff I got. I've got a wax. I got an SSS. I got an ambient inclusion. Let's just do shadows and things like this. So it'll render faster. So the only thing we're rendering now are shadows. So now I need to tell ZBrush when this render is done, I want these eyes to be transparent. Okay. So down here in display properties, there are BPR settings. And this is per subtool basis. So then I would come here and tell it to be transparent. Then I would have to make sure in the rendering properties, I have transparent on as well. So you're going to need that on, and you're going to need the other button on in the subtool if you want to render with ZBrush BPR. And then when you render, that will then kick in, and then it'll see, and then boom, there you go. The eyes are transparent. So the eye I colorized is on the body, and now those spheres are becoming transparent. So this is how you would do it with BPR. It's about making what you want to be transparent as a separate piece of topology and then calling that out to be transparent and then turning on transparent. Okay, so if you're doing the redshift, you just need to make the material transparent. So you would need to come in here into your materials. And there's now three types of materials. Really, if you want to go, there's four because there's matte cap materials, there's standard materials, and then there's two types of redshift materials. There's ones that maintain the poly paint and there's ones that don't maintain the poly paint. So you, there's already some here where there is a material like see there's simple glass, clear, there's liquids here. So you can just assign this. So I'm going to now need in the renderer, I'm going to need to say I want to use Redshift. So I need to turn that on so that it is on. So it knows to use Redshift and use these Redshift materials. And now I want to fill these eyes with now the Redshift material. So I need to go to M up here, color, fill object. And then they are now slated to be transparent when we go to render. Okay, so if I want to render out just a section, I can do a render region where you control R will render just a region, a region, a region of that model with Redshift. Okay, so all this data now has got to get sent to Redshift so it can calculate. So the higher polygon counts you have, the more data it's got to be sent to Redshift. And you can see the eyes already rendering transparent for me. And then now this, that's a redshift. So this squared portion right here is a redshift render with the transparency of those spheres. 
And then all of this, all of it can be exported as a movie, all right, to be given out and to export it and be put whatever you want. So if you want to do a movie like I have my timeline, you would render first with the preferred render. So if you're going to use BPR, you'd render with BPR first. If you're going to use Redshift, you would do a full render first so that ZBrush knows that's what you want. So here's a full Redshift render starting up. That's my global illumination, excuse me, for this. And then now it's going to start rendering out this with Redshift. So if I want the movie of this render, I do this first. Or if I wanted ZBrush BPR, I would do the BPR first. Then I would tell ZBrush to create the movie. And then it would go render out each frame of the movie for you with the render that you choose. So once this is done, which will be done here in a second, which this is pretty fast. Let's see how long this took, even streaming that took 43 seconds on this system. Okay. And for now, up here in this movie timeline, I would hold down control shift. Again, that's control and shift together. And then click right on that little icon part right there. You'll see ZBrush go through, calculate the whole timeline, and then start rendering each frame. I'm not gonna do it here because this 40, it would be 43 seconds time the number of frames. Like this is hours. This is not going to be <laughs> done in minutes rendering out. It's hundreds of frames. It's got to render out at 43 yep. seconds a frame. Yep. And something I, I would like to mention too, with with now that Redshift rendering has been added in ZBrush, uh, the the really cool thing is that you know you have a really solid render engine built inside. So, but the way I work personally is I focus on my sculpting. I do all my sculpting. And then afterwards, I put my rendering hat still, but I don't have to leave ZBrush to get my the renders that I'm looking for. So it's a really cool addition. So kind of think of it in that way too. Is that you know, it, I mean, rendering alongside of of sculpting, you know, for me always felt a little convoluted. So this is a really cool way to like, okay, I'm done sculpting. Now I'm going to do some test renders, and then I'm going to go back to sculpting. And so if you're using Redshift materials and you want to kind of like switch back and forth like that, just Remember that you can always shift click the little brush icon on your sub tools to just hide all your materials and color, and then you could repopulate them back while you're doing this. So if you want to make some changes, go through, you know, restroom materials are there, but it's a nice way to kind of switch back and forth. That's the way I've been using it, which I think is really, really awesome. Yep. Uh, so there you go. There's how you yeah. you do that. I think that's there we go. I think that's all that's... of them. Yeah, I think that's about it, you know? Well, like Paul and I said at the very beginning of this, we're going to be doing this once a month, and then we're going to be taking this stream and basically breaking down into individual videos so you can go and search them under the Ask ZBrush. And the idea here is that we can actually answer a lot of questions and some questions on the fly so that you can get the answer a little bit quicker than before. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this stream. This was a lot of fun. I had a blast. Paul, it's always amazing to stream with you. Always I just love streaming. Fun. Again, I'm going to put the link um, in here if you guys want to show my screen real quick. Like Ian said, the AskZBrush.com. This is where you want to go. For those that are joining us that didn't see this in the beginning, every single Ask ZBrush video that's ever been shot is here on this web page. What this does for you, even though they're all on our YouTube channel, you can search only Ask ZBrush videos. So a lot of times you guys have questions. There might already be, there's 15 pages, people. There's almost 500 videos. Some questions you might have might already be here. Okay, so you can also search here. I can say, I can start writing and see Dyna, and then it starts finding videos that have the word Dyna in it. And then you can say, just give me that result. And then you're going to get those videos with that. Okay, so you can just start writing out and see now all those videos are starting to populate. And the cool part is, this will also find even streams that have that in it as well. So this will you see all this Dyna mesh stuff. Here's a couple streams that Ian did. That has stuff in there with that. And the, all the Ask ZBrush videos are here. You can ask any question that you want here. And this is what we're going to be doing in these streams. We're going to be taking the upvoted ones. So vote on your question is here. And then all you do is you click on this tab right here. And then all the questions are right here that you are sending to us. And whatever ones you want to go vote up, I really want this one answered. You come here and you just upvote it. And we took... 
the six the most popular ones already on here. So we already answered six of the top ones here. So we, we're hoping this will catch on for you all. And then our goal is every month, Ian and I, if we can at least both of us, if not at least one of us, get in here, answer six or seven of these questions for you live, and then take what we just did, take some more questions from you. Absolutely. And if you have questions that you want to do, please just go over to AskSeaverse.com, plop that question in there, and then that's going to populate a new list. And also, if you have, if you see a question that you like, upvote it because then that gets kicked to the top. So the more votes that gets, the more likely that that's going to be answered. So definitely plop that in there. And yeah, I'm excited. This is so much, so much fun. Thank you guys again. This was amazing. And as always, happy ZBrushing, happy sculpting. Tag us whenever you create something new, and we'll catch you guys later. Bye.